Uh, Benjamin uh, Sobakol is, is the director of the Danish Center for Energy Technology from Aarhus University. Um, um, he's professor of, uh, of business and social science from this uh, university. And the reason why he's here is mainly because where well, he's, uh, according to some colleagues, I asked one of the top experts in Europe regarding to this, uh, um, well, to basically to the consequences uh, uh, of uh, um, green energies that are being implemented right now in the European Union uh, and all these decarbonization processes that are taking place. Uh, um, and he's looking at, um, I would say from a rather uh, um, systemic way, which is nice because uh, uh, particularly right now in science, we have this tendency to, to look at uh, in a rather, rather narrow way uh, a public policies, okay? So I, I think it's very welcome this, this approach. And I think we can learn quite a lot uh, from this presentation. So uh, Professor uh, Sobakol, you can already start whenever you feel. Can I, okay. can I just for a second explain a couple of technical details so to make sure that the conference sure. is going to be okay? Uh, it's always good, Francesco. Yes, please do. <laughs> yes, yes, because uh, this is also one of the first times that we're actually going with the online stuff. So, okay, for all the participants in the session, we already talked about the structure, and we know that this is going to be the presentation first, and then we're going to have a five minutes break, and then we're going to open the debate part. But all the students, you are encouraged to keep your video on if you want the professor to have, you know, some kind of contact with you and see you. And at the same time, it is best if you keep your mic silenced so the microphone will be switched off so that we can give him the word to speak. Um, after that, we were thinking with Javier, when it comes to the time of the debate, uh, if you could uh, write it in the chat that you have a question and then you open your mic, we're, we're going to try, uh, we'll go a little bit with some moderation and we'll try to avoid that people, you know, speak on top of each other. So after that, people can write in the chat in the second part uh, about that they want, they have a question and they want to intervene and then they can open their, their mic and they can make the question. Uh, Javier and I will try a little bit to provide moderation in the online event. In the online event. So I think that is all. Um, we may give the word to Professor Sobakul right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, and I promise I will turn my video on later so you can actually see me. I'm in my office. I came all the way into the office today just so I would have the best internet connection uh, for the lecture. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I just wanted to highlight, I actually do have a second affiliation. It's very confusing because I have an affiliation in Denmark, but also an affiliation in the UK, um, which is no longer a part of Europe, apparently. But uh, you can reach me at either. <laughs> I go back and forth between the two, and I'm quite happy about that because in many ways, Denmark is still ahead of the UK in terms of its uh, energy and climate policies. Today's presentation was chosen by Javier. So if you don't like it, you can direct all of the criticisms to him. And if you loved it, well, then I can take, I guess, some of the, the compliments. I want to emphasize as well, you see this nice, really uh, wonderful European Union flag on the front slide. And that's just to thank the European Union for funding the research today. So a lot of the research I'm going to present comes from two projects. One is funded by the research councils here in the UK. It's called the Center on Innovation and Energy Demand, where we looked at the energy justice issues around new innovations. And then we have another one funded by Horizon 2020 called In the Paths, Innovation Pathways for Decarbonization, where we actually looked at uh, energy justice issues in four European transitions, which I'm gonna talk about in the latter part of, of, of the talk. So yeah, I thought whenever you talk to students and whenever it's by Zoom, it's really good to have a roadmap. So I just wanna let you all know, in the hour or so I've got to talk to you, I thought, given many of you aren't necessarily experts in energy and climate, or experts in energy justice, I thought I'd tell you what it is. <laughs> what do these terms mean? Where do they come from? Why are we putting the word justice next to the word energy? Then I would move to a review paper that we did a little bit ago, a few years ago, although I think it's still accurate, <clears throat> that talks about the kind of state of the art for energy justice research and important gaps. We called them frontiers that have kind of emerged that I still think are worth addressing. Then I would tell you about the Inipaths project, the four European case studies and what it means uh, for those of us here in Europe. And I will let you know, Spain is not one of the transitions, I'm sorry, but there are many transitions around Spain, including France, uh, Germany, the UK and Norway. 
And then finally, at the end, I think I'd come back to what this means, what this means for those of us doing research, what this means for maybe your careers even, what it means for policymaking and how we make decisions. So quite a list of important tasks. So to start with, what in the world is energy justice? Probably new to you, you may have seen terms like climate justice, environmental justice, social justice. Energy justice is a bit different and it's relatively new as in it really hasn't existed other than in the past two decades. And I've been cursed or benefited by having to do three books on energy justice. And I wanted to just kind of show you how we went in order. And so the first book, which is here, it might win the award for one of the ugliest covers. Thank you, Rutledge. Uh, this book is all about energy injustice. So we kind of started with what's wrong. What are the ways in which energy systems can actually have negative impacts on what we mean about justice? And this thing means we have like a laundry list. It's one of the most depressing books you'll read because in it, we talk about oil and gas and human rights abuses, even human rights abuses with things like minerals and metals which are needed for low carbon systems. We talk about the connections with energy and conflict, civil war, resource conflicts, world wars, World War I, World War II. Energy resources even played a small role in the Vietnam War and a very big role in the Cold War. We talk about emerging notions of energy poverty, which is how we have 2 billion people, billion people around the world who still don't have access to modern energy services especially for cooking, and fuel poverty, which even exists in Spain. Fuel poverty is the inability for you to afford energy or adequate warmth in things like the winter or adequate coolness in the summer. We talk about a whole array of externalities with energy, deforestation, water use, land use, climate change, energy accidents. And then we also talk about some of the policy and planning issues of how people are marginalized or excluded, how they don't have free prior informed consent. The second book tried to be a bit more positive, also a very colorful cover. (laughs) The second book tried to move from what's wrong with what does justice tell us. So we tried to draw on major philosophical influences. And if you see here, we had eight. And if you have really good eyes, you can see the top four, virtue, utility, human rights, and procedural justice are kind of classic justice issues. These go back thousands of years. The Magna Carta was passed in the 12th century, for instance. Notions of virtue go back to Aristotle and Plato, which are before the time of Jesus Christ. So very, very old notions of justice. And the bottom four are very new. These are all justice approaches and theories in our generation, which means they've happened either this century or last century with people like John Rawls or Martia Sen or the Libertarians or people talking about future generations or very recently, the ethics of climate change. So it's a neat book in that it takes eight topics and it reframes them as important justice issues and it tells you what justice reveals about each of those eight topics. And then the final book, which is the most uplifting the most positive, moving from the negative and the descriptive to the positive, is case studies of energy justice in practice. So this book is positive because it takes eight cases around the world of where communities or companies or countries have pushed energy justice concerns and addressed them with policy or business models or changes. Whether it's Denmark, pursuing a moratorium on coal and a very aggressive energy policy putting wind energy and energy efficiency and combined heat and power because they really wanted to preserve the availability of energy for all Danish citizens. Or there was a very ambitious program here in the UK, in Great Britain, where it brought 4 million homes out of fuel poverty. It was called the Warm Front Program. Or the World Bank, has what's called an independent accountability mechanism. It's an inspection panel where if you have been harmed by any of the World Bank's projects, you can appeal. And the inspection panel, which is independent, has closed down negative energy systems, dams, coal mines, wind farms, waste to energy facilities, whenever they don't meet the actual principles of the World Bank. 
The EITI is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This is a major voluntary initiative where 52 countries, 52 countries have signed on to be transparent and release information about oil, gas, and minerals. The argument here is it helps minimize corruption and it helps fight the resource curse. And these countries manage $2 trillion in energy and, uh, and gas assets. So major shifts in these actors deciding to disclose information to improve governance and accountability. We talk about Sao Tome, which is a very small country in the Gulf of Guinea off the coast of Nigeria. Sao Tome has a very progressive oil law that saves for future generations. So they get revenues now and they invest it in a fund that explicitly benefits the marginalized, the vulnerable, and the future. We talk about solar energy in Bangladesh where they have a very nice solar home systems program that targets women. So here's a good example of trying to build equity from women and looking at the gender energy access nexus. There's a major fund that raised about a billion dollars uh, led by the Global Environment Facility called the Least Developed Countries Fund. This fund put 66 least developed countries, countries like Malawi or Laos or Cambodia, um, poorest countries build their responsiveness to climate change. And again, it was entirely voluntary. Countries like Germany or Norway giving money in the fund. And then finally, Ecuador had a very neat case where they decided to try to strand their oil assets near a, a nature reserve to protect indigenous people and keep the oil in the ground. So a bit uplifting. And while not all of these cases still exist today, the Warm Front program has been has finished of the Yasuni initiative is finished, it was at least a kind of uplifting to see eight examples all around the world of where people have tried to make more ethical energy transitions. Drawing from this huge body of work, all the cases, all the philosophical principles, all of the injustices, we've tried to kind of simplify things to say energy justice means four things, only four. You have lists, as Javier might tell you, Never have them more than three or four points. Always try to keep them short. And so energy justice involves costs and hazards of energy and how they're disseminated. It involves benefits or how they're owned, how equitable you can access modern energy systems, things like nuclear power or electric vehicles or energy efficient lights. It looks at policies and procedures that they're fair, that they're representative, that they respect individuals. And it looks at um, recognition which is a, a kind of special lens for how energy systems might impact extremely vulnerable groups like indigenous citizens, uh, ethnic minorities, single parents, the homeless, the mentally ill, the disabled, uh, who might not need equal treatment. They may need special treatment and consideration. Most uh, energy justice work sits within a nexus, and I really like this work from Darren. Darren has been kind of trying to show you what's different from energy justice. So you can see here on the left diagram, if you're talking about energy security, well, that's really more about availability. And if we're talking only about carbon, that's more about sustainability. If you're talking only about poverty, that's kind of about accessibility. And energy justice has the benefit of sitting right in the middle in a way that allows us to talk about all of those things security, availability, carbon, poverty, accessibility in a single framework. And in doing so, energy justice is meant to sit in the middle of all of the work that we see coming from economics, coming from environmental studies, coming from political science. So again, it's a nice multi-sectoral frame and a nice interdisciplinary frame. I like this as well. Raphael and Darren have talked about just transitions or just transformations, and they're really good at acronyms. So you can see here, just can be spelled out to mean justice, universal space and time. And again, you can see the four elements that I mentioned, distribution, procedures, recognition, uh, as well as kind of a special attention to spatial and temporal complexity that I kind of like. And you can operationalize this framework whenever you're looking at different energy transitions around the world. What we've done, again, is tried to synthesize all of this into more simplified conceptual frameworks. And again, we probably should have named them. <laughs> uh, we didn't. So for lack of a better term, the two frameworks that are used in the literature, and they're used by more than 100 studies. The first one is called the tenants framework. 
like the movie Tenants, which maybe you've seen. The Tenants framework talks about four different strands of energy justice work, distributive justice, procedural justice, cosmopolitan justice, and recognition justice. And it shows here what they mean, and then you can apply them to a specific technology or policy or case study. In this particular case, electric vehicles. That's what the Tenants approach looks like. The other approach, for lack of a better term, is the principles approach. And this approach tries to talk about 10 different principles. And if you think back to the energy justice book that I just mentioned, the case study book, note that the first eight cases match the first eight principles. Availability, due process, sustainability, equity, responsibility. So the argument here is these principles help guide us for what we should be doing when we talk about more ethical energy systems change. And what we've done at the bottom is we added two new principles, resistance, you shouldn't be passive and allow evil to triumph, you should stand up and resist it, and respect for intersectionality, that sometimes these principles don't operate equally and they may intersect with things like race or gender or other types of dominant social structures. At this point too, I've given you a lot of work that's my own. Of course, energy justice is far more than just me. If you are really fascinated in it, I highly recommend some of these other works, which I'll just put here, you can review them later. Kirsten Jenkins has a very nice review uh, about kind of how energy justice is both evaluative and normative. So it kind of bridges that divide between description and prescription. Uh, here are just some excellent works that I've enjoyed reading in the past few years. There's Raphael and Darren's piece on the just transition. There's Duncan talking about the ethics of geoengineering. So there's taking energy justice to a new space negative emissions technologies. And then Noel and Jenny have a, a great piece about what's called embodied energy injustices, which I'll talk about more in a moment. It's about injustices throughout the life cycle of an energy system, not just at, at its point of use, but at the stage of minerals and mining, extraction, transport, manufacturing, construction, use, and afterlife, disposal, decommissioning, waste. Uh, so it really reveals the transboundary life cycle issues of different energy supply chains. And then I lastly would urge you to kind of check out the special issue we had two years ago in applied energy called uh, low carbon energy systems and energy justice. And if you don't have access to it, just email me. I'm happy to email you um, the entire special issue. If you like books, we're often told no one reads books anymore, but, but hey, <laughs> I then recommend these two. Gordon Walker has a fantastic book on environmental justice, but about half of his cases are energy, so I think it fits. His cases are things like waste to energy or landfills and wind energy or fuel poverty. And on the right, we have an edited book by Karen, Gordon, and Harriet, which is excellent because it's European focused. So all of the cases in the book are actually looking here at Europe. So it's a good kind of up-to-date take on what energy justice is happening here in, in our region. All right, so that's the first part of the talk. And I'm spot on for time, hurrah. <laughs> so the other the second part is really about, okay, you've now seen in what, 15 minutes, a bunch of books, special issues, articles, and principles thrown at you. So it's hard, I know. Uh, and many of you are finding this entirely new. So what about the field of energy justice? From, from our take, where is it, where ought it go? And what we tried to do in this piece is talk about six gaps, six fruitful areas that even today in 2020, I think are very much worth exploring. So the first one goes back to my own work. So you, one of the nice things about energy justice, it's okay to critique yourself, <laughs> maybe even encouraged. And when you see this list, this is the book that I already presented, and you see all of the major philosophical influences that have shaped the book, there's a problem. It's actually two problems. And if I was with you in person, I'd ask you to raise your hand and tell me the problems, but of course, we can't do that. Problem number one, they're mostly men, aren't they? Other than Edith Brown Weiss, and I think Dale Jamison, all the other people, and Martha Nussbaum, every other scholar here is a man. And secondly, they're almost entirely from the North or the West. Amartya Sen is Indian, but got his PhD at Oxford, so I'm not even sure he qualifies as being from the South. So what about non-Western, non-European, non-masculine notions of justice? What about all these 
other systems of justice that we could fruitfully draw on from those like Ubuntu and South Africa or the Asian notions of Taoism or Buddhism or even some of the indigenous perspectives coming from places like the Americas. All of them we think have equal validity. We don't have to have a Western bias when it comes to justice theory. The second one is it's probably obvious, justice so far for us is about helping humans. So there is an inherent anthropocentrism built into justice. What about other forms of life? What about the rights of nature? What about other species? What about non-human species? What about the biosphere? What about Gaia? Shouldn't these have equal consideration? What about environmental ethics? And again, we also think that we should start to expand justice to go beyond looking at humans. And this isn't just me. Martha Nussbaum, who's one of the leading justice experts, has a book about frontiers and justice. Overall, not energy justice, just actual frontiers of justice period, where one of her three areas is species. The other one being those with disabilities and the other one being accounting for cultural relativism and nationality. So again, obviously very much at the cutting edge to be thinking about non-human, non-anthropocentric forms of justice, whether they're animal-centric, biocentric, or ecocentric. We also think these have equally fruitful things to say about how we think about justice. The third area is also one critiquing my work. Remember I was telling you some of my case studies of justice, the Warm Front program in Great Britain the energy policy and planning in Denmark. Well, one of the problem with these approaches is they only look at a country. And in fact, many of our most pressing justice issues are multi-scalar. Look here at the amount of carbon embodied in different traded goods and services. China, the Middle East, India are net exporters of carbon. 80% of China's carbon leaves the country. It's embodied in the, the coffee cups and the plastic toys and the cars and the other things we buy here in the global north. And look at the United States, Japan, and UK. We're net carbon importers. So is it really fair to put a national bubble around these countries when it's all circulating in this complex globalized economy? It is kind of wrong because, well, Denmark is only able to be low carbon because it's part of the Nordic power pool and it's funneling energy up to Norway and it's also exporting power to Germany. And let's not also forget that the Nordic region is actually depending on China and South Korea to make its wind turbines. So we actually did a nice environmental profit and loss of Northern European wind turbines. And I won't bore you with the details, it got quite technical. We basically looked at the embodied carbon, air pollution and waste, including electronic waste, incinerated waste and waste sent to landfill. And it's amazing. For a typical offshore wind turbine, you know, 78% of its externalities happen in China and South Korea. So the, the way to read this graph is of course, wind energy is clean in Northern Europe because all the costs, all the environmental costs of making it happen somewhere else. And let's not also forget that the Nordic region is a net exporter of fossil fuels. So countries like Norway are paying for their decarbonization by selling fossil fuel. So it's really, really tricky. So a multi-scalar analysis brings these troublesome trends into focus. And it's basically like saying, if you're Norway, we think slavery is wrong. We're abolishing slavery, but we're going to sell you some slaves to pay for it. So you start to really get a sense for the difficult moral questions that come from cross-scalar analysis. A fourth new frontier, Energy justice is often seen as bad for business. And I really love this quote from Abraham Lincoln, the old president in the United States, who used to say, you can't see the word of justice when it's covered by a silver dollar. And he used to illustrate this point by putting a silver dollar on the front of a Bible. So the kind of argument is you can't see morality if you're consumed by greed. But does that always mean there's trade-offs between business and justice? We think no, and we have actually found in another study Four examples, three of them in Europe, of where communities have used business models to simultaneously create jobs and revenue and also meet energy justice goals. So it shows it doesn't have to be a trade-off all the time. You can design pro-just and pro-business energy models, although they do tend to be very rare. 
many times it's cooperatives or community interest companies uh, or things at the smaller scale energy service contracts. We're not talking about BP and ExxonMobil, put it that way, but it does exist. The fifth example is a bit depressing. And the fifth example is that even when you try to promote justice, you tend to create injustice somewhere. You never eliminate injustice. You only redistribute it. So here we've actually shown in, remember I told you about those global countries pursuing adaptation around the world, trying to build their resilience to climate change. Well, you can see here in, in many cases around the world, Australia, Honduras, Norway, Alaska, Tanzania, the Maldives, Burkina Faso, and Kenya, those intervention pathways have been captured by elites and have actually had damaging effects on local people. So even though we're trying to do good, the fact that we operate in a global capitalist political economy means we end up doing bad. Um, and I can illustrate this with a few nice photographs, since I know there's been a lot of slides, so we can take a step back and look at some photographs. These show you conventional cars from Europe. When Europe buys electric vehicles, where do the conventional cars go? They don't just disappear. They end up here like places in Ghana. So again, we're not eliminating the fossil fueled cars. We're just redistributing to where they go and they end up in places in the global south. Or here, this is a nine-year-old coal miner in India. Remember I mentioned earlier how two billion people around the world lack modern energy access. So we then create a desire to keep energy affordable. But that desire to make energy affordable means it needs to be low cost. And to make it low cost means you then have things like child labor in coal supply chains. Now, this lump of coal that this young miner is actually holding will provide energy for a village. So what a trade-off. Is it just? Is it okay to have this child suffer so that other children get energy access? That's a very difficult question, but it certainly shows that this child is losing as India becomes more electrified. Or here, these are coal miners with black lung disease in China. China has almost a million coal miners with black lung disease. And again, is it fair that they're working in the mines to provide modern standards of living by coal? But in reality, you will have their own lives shortened, in many cases by decades. And then a final example. These are thyroid cancer victims from Chernobyl. And what's quite tragic about this photograph is it's from 2015. And for those of you that don't remember, Chernobyl was 1986. This boy is only 11. So how did he get thyroid cancer 20 years after Chernobyl? Well, the fact is because Chernobyl is still resulting in radioactivity and pollution across Belarus and Ukraine, so that you have some of the highest thyroid cancer rates per capita in the world. And yet, the nuclear power at Chernobyl and in Eastern Europe helped lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and helped modernize all of Eastern Europe. So again, is it fair? Is it right? Well, no, there are always losers somewhere if you can look for them in a lot of these energy justice transitions. And so we always need to be aware of the political economy of justice. And then the final thing, the final new frontier is one of discourse. And this is just meant to be, everyone likes to use justice rhetoric when they're not being just. Even criminals, even people like President Trump will say they're just as they're doing the very things counter to justice. And there's a geographer called David Harvey who says we must always beware of the false utopianisms of justice and how many times people use justice words to hide how they're only dispossessing others of their land or their assets or their wealth. So we have to be very careful about using justice as a discourse. And as just some examples, this would be like Chevron running ads like this we think that oil companies should support the communities they're a part of. The same month, they admitted in court to actually killing community members who were opposing oil and gas infrastructure in Ecuador. Or this, you may remember uh, Volkswagen and Audi had ran an ad campaign where diesel vehicles were supposed to be clean, but it turns out they were actually falsifying the diesel emissions tests, and they knew very well that diesel was not clean. So again, situation of where you have actors strategically using energy justice discourse to hide how unjust they're being. So maybe there's something there uh, to what Harvey says about being more critical. So to put some of this into practice, it's been a bit abstract, 
I wanted to tell you a little bit more about this Inner Paths project, where we did look at two of the new frontiers. So to refresh your memory, we had six new frontiers. The third one was cross-scalar analysis, and the fifth one was political economy. So this research project was designed, we did it after the New Frontiers paper. So we only started it in 2017, so it's very new. We explicitly designed it to fit those two goals. So it also is a nice response, right, an engagement with two of the frontiers. And remember I mentioned earlier the piece by Noel Healy and Jenny. Here it is again, and it just shows you in their work, what they've done is revealed the sacrifice zones the zones of sacrifice around the life cycle of coal. And they've done it in a way that's really neat. They show you some of the harms of extracting and processing coal in Colombia, and they show you some of the harms of using it in places like the United States. And their argument is that too much of our research and policy attention is just on the square there of environmental impact statement. So much of our work, so much of our EIAs and our SEIAs our social environmental impact statements focus only on where the technology is used. The wind farm, the solar panel, the coal, the coal fired power plant, that we miss all these other elements of the life cycle, like extraction and minerals or disposal and waste. And what Noel did in his study is he revealed it for coal. So we wanted to go a step further and say, aha, we know they exist for coal. We know they exist for oil and probably gas. What about low carbon interventions. Do they also exist for those? And so we chose four very big and well-known European transitions, probably ones even you might have heard of. We chose nuclear power in France. France is one of the largest countries that with nuclear power provides about 75% of their electricity, and they are the largest exporter of nuclear power in the world and they are the second largest exporter of nuclear technology after China. So a major nuclear transition. Upper right is solar energy in Germany. Germany started promoting this in 1990 and they accelerated it with their EEG in 2000 to the point where now Germany has more solar energy per capita than any other country in the world. The bottom left is battery electric vehicles in Norway. Norway has now 66% of new car sales are BEVs. Their market per capita is 30 times bigger than China's, which is the second biggest market. So again, Norway is by default the world leader in electric vehicles, hands down. And the bottom right is a smart meter for electricity and gas with an in-home display here in Great Britain. Great Britain has a plan to ask every home and small business to adopt a smart meter by 2024, that'll be 56 million smart meters. So again, four very big transitions. Two of them are supply side, nuclear, solar. Two are demand side, EVs and smart meters. And also we chose four transitions with very different time periods. Nuclear power is promoted and accelerated in the 70s and 80s with the Mesmer plan. Solar energy picks up in the 90s and 2000s. Battery electric vehicles pick up last decade and smart meters are now. We're in the middle of the smart meter transition. So again, a nice mix of different temporalities, different types of technologies, and of course, different countries. We are a big fan. I won't bore you with this because many of you don't really care about methods, but just to kind of reveal, we like mixed methods research designs. And so here it just means we did three. We did what are called expert interviews. So we talked to people and I'm amazed, even though we were looking explicitly at the injustices of these transitions, the access that we had to experts was phenomenal. I never would have guessed that the Atomic Energy Commission or EDF in France would speak to us, but they did to their credit, or the Ministry of Economic Affairs or the Solar Energy Society in Germany. They knew we were critical and they still managed to give us their views, or the Ministry of Transport in Norway or the Nordic Electric Vehicle Association or the Department of Energy here in the UK or Smart Energy GB, which is the government voice of the rollout. So again, excellent involvement from our experts. But because we were looking at justice, we didn't wanna to be too elitist and only have opinions from experts. So then we also ran focus groups where ordinary people could come, they could get a coffee, they sit with us for an hour, an hour and a half, and we would also ask our questions. And because a lot of these interviews were in urban areas, 
we intentionally selected the focus groups to be in rural areas. So Lewis in Great Britain, Colmar in France, Freiburg in Germany, where we had so many people, we had to split it into two focus groups, and Stavanger in Norway. Even though we had good participation in the focus groups and the interviews, that's still a pretty small sample, right? You have fewer than 100 interviews. We have fewer than 30 people at the focus groups. So that's a very slim portion of humanity when you're trying to understand the broader justice implications. So we then did a third method that I thought was kind of clever, where we joined major internet forums in each of the three countries that had 2 million members. So the argument here was people could have at least had an opportunity to engage if they couldn't make it to the focus group. And we picked up an additional almost 60 responses from these different internet forums. We asked the same questions and followed the same protocol in all three of the methods, which enables what's called triangulation. We could see how much comments come up and injustices come up across the different material. And we were quite rigorous. We actually coded them all, fully transcribed them all, and gave you frequency counts. So here what you can see, we used the tenants approach. So we broke down injustices into four tenants, distributive, procedural, cosmopolitan, recognition. This shows you the distributive ones for France. And you can see the number, we put them in order. You can see how each injustice is different from the other, right? Tax burden is very different than accident, which is very different than waste, which is very different than cost. And you can see how much it comes up in the material. RI is research interview, FG is focus group, IF is internet forum, and then the frequency counts. So we put it in order for you to see easily whether it came up once or it came up a lot. And this again, if I was with you in person, I would ask, how many did we find? Okay, four transitions. Did we find 20 injustices, 30 injustices? And many of you would raise your hands and maybe ask and say maybe 50 or 60. We were completely shocked. We found from our material 120 injustices, which is more than we ever thought. And what you can see here is distribution dominates them. We were very worried that the second most common type of injustice is recognition. And remember, recognitional justice are about, are about vulnerable groups. So the homeless, indigenous people, mentally able, the elderly, single parent families. So it's really, really troubling that we're hurting them. Cosmopolitan issues, which are global issues, or third procedural issues, which are issues of planning, are, are fourth. And what was also amazing is smart meters had the most injustices, which we were never expecting, followed by nuclear power. Now, I don't think you want to say that that means that nuclear is less unjust than solar. It's just perhaps our material. And maybe because smart meters are more intrusive, they're in the home, whereas nuclear power is seen as more distant and it's kind of invisible that people are able to articulate more injustices for smart meters. Um, and solar photovoltaics had, had the fewest number of injustices. So quite a shocking study. Remember that we were asking questions about multi-scalar stuff. Remember that was one of the big reasons we did the study. So one of our questions was, in these transitions, what types of injustices occur outside of Europe? And again, we were shocked. <laughs> we never expected there to be so many. And we developed this kind of multi-spatial, multi-temporal framework, maybe we should have named it something, that again, similar to Noel Healy, is telling you don't just look at where the energy is consumed or used, and don't just look at the local scale. Broaden your lens to look at production, distribution, and manufacturing. Broaden your lens to look at disposal, waste, and recycling. Broaden your lens to look at the meso level at how these transitions reverberate nationally and globally. And this is perhaps one of the most shocking things. Four European transitions in the middle of Europe have impacts around the world. From our material, everything you see in red comes from our respondents who identified in some way the transitions in yellow affecting those in red, whether it is uh, the push for EVs threatening oil sands markets in Canada, or the push for solar interrupting LNG exports from the United States, or the battery electric vehicle and smart meter transition relying on lithium, which is mined in South America, or cobalt, which is mined in Sub-Saharan Africa. In the middle there, you see the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or waste flows that end up in Ghana. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Or the interruption of coal exports from Australia, 
or poor working conditions for solar panels in China, or the erosion of profits for Gazprom in Russia. So it really shows, very troublingly, these transitions are multi-scalar, and they cascade with impacts all the way around the world, at least if you qualitatively draw from our material. And with that in mind, we decided to do a phase two of the study, because remember, when you see stuff like this, it's just a list. It's just a laundry list. And whether an injustice is a battery electric vehicle causing a traffic jam or contributing to someone dying in a cobalt mine is treated the same. We don't qualitatively differentiate the severity of the injustice. So there is a problem with these lists. We don't prioritize. We don't have a hierarchy. We don't wait. We don't wait them. Uh, and so we wanted to do a second study that kind of got into, well, let's go the other extreme and let's find a particular community who has been marginalized by these transitions and only one community. So this phase was community focused. And again, we chose four communities. For nuclear power, we sent a research team to French wineries because in fact, a lot of the wineries are hurt by nuclear because of things like changes in climate, because of things like water consumption and because of things like nuclear accidents. We chose manufacturing for German solar energy because many of you may not know, most German solar manufacturing has gone bankrupt. It's the Chinese who've stepped in to create economies of scale. And that means you have whole communities in Germany that have collapsed because they no longer make solar energy. We chose e-waste, electronic waste for smart meters because 70% of electronic waste in Great Britain goes to Ghana, and it goes to a single site called Ogbog Bloshi. And finally, for electric vehicles, we chose cobalt mining, where we sent a team that I led to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to actually talk to and interview people about industrial cobalt mining and artisanal cobalt mining. And again, sticking with the mixed methods research approach, we did a host of expert interviews, we did a host of community interviews. So we spoke to winemakers, we spoke to sellers, we spoke to uh, manufacturers of solar energy, union leaders, bosses, mayors. We talked to scrapyard workers, politicians, and those vendors at e-waste facilities. And then we talked to co uh, artisanal cobalt miners, bosses, crushers, carriers, traders, police, and safety inspectors. So a very robust mixed methods research design. And we rounded it off with a incredible number of site visits. My poor French research fellow had to go to seven vineyards. So tough, seven in the Rhone Valley. Although we also had to visit three nuclear power plants. So I guess there was a bit of a trade-off there. Um, my research team in Germany visited eight solar manufacturing sites. And then I visited 20 scrapyards in Ghana and 30 mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And again, um, the res results are bleak. So the results are not a laundry list of injustices. We didn't quantify them. These results are more qualitative. So you can see in France, the Rhone Valley, wine growers have been affected in the vicinity of where nuclear plants are. They're even afraid that there's radioactive material, tritium, cesium, in the water supply. One winemaker, we made the mistake of believing that the cohabitation with nuclear would be profitable. We were wrong. And look at this. Some very particular Appalachians for wine have lost 40% of their sales. 40%. These are small wineries. They have very, very small margins. Imagine losing almost half of their sales because some nuclear power plant had an incident where they released tritium into the water supply. And perhaps it's even better illustrated with photographs like this. Look at how close the vineyards get to the nuclear plant. This is Triscotin with vineyards that go right up to the edge. As one of the winemakers told us, imagine if this was on the bottle of wine. Would you buy it? They've even tried to change their name so they're not associated with Triscotin, but they can't because that's the region of where they are. And they've been making wine for thousands of years. So it's very, very damaging to them that nuclear, which is only 40 years old, has completely upended their lifestyles. Our second example is in Germany. And again, not one we ever expected. Who would have guessed one of the most vulnerable groups to solar energy are solar workers themselves. We traveled to Bitterfeld Wolfen, which is near the Polish border. So it's East Germany, it's South Germany. 
And you can see here, this is a phenomenal quote, the real vulnerable group from the solar transition is German solar workers. You have trade unions going on and on and on about saving coal and saving nuclear, yet Solar World and other big producers have shut down 100,000 people, 100,000 people have lost their jobs. The workers in the German solar sector are a vulnerable population. Or you could even have it much shorter. This is what one mayor told us. Berlin got the electricity, we got the ashes. And now Bitterfeld Wolfen is entirely almost abandoned. They've lost their manufacturing base, they've lost jobs, they've lost their pensions, they've lost tax revenue, and they've also inherited very bleak industrial landscapes like this, which they actually have to maintain on top of the fact that these no longer operate. They have to make sure that no one vandalizes them and they have to make sure that they're indemnified and insured. Uh, and again, this shows you who is left behind in the race to make solar energy as cheap as it can be. And this shows you some of the vandalized factories. And this shows you the former Sun Park, which is where Q-cells used to be, which was the world's number one manufacturer, which now has been greatly reduced and merged with Chinese overseas interests. There are no Q-cells workers anymore at Bitterfield Wolfen. So again, the legacies of lost manufacturing as capitalism shifts the regime dynamics of manufacturing. Our third area, uh, maybe even more bleak, is Ghana, where we've just done work on waste. And this is where a lot of the high-tech waste goes. This is in Ogbogboshi, which is near Accra, Ghana, which is in Sub-Saharan Africa. And again, this, although we related this to smart meters, it's not the only technology, because obviously a lot of our waste flows uh, have electronic items, semiconductors, chips, computer circuit boards, printed circuit boards, uh, liquid crystal displays and batteries. So even though this connects very nicely with smart meters, it also connects to solar energy, battery electric vehicles, uh, fuel cells, even nuclear reactors have elements of e-waste circuits and circuit breakers that end up in places like Ghana. And again, look at this quote. More than 100,000 people live here on this waste in complete poverty. Young boys and girls, children as young as six, are engaged in this business, they miss school or they drop out or they look for scrap to pay for school. And he tells a story of a young boy who was 12, who died because he got infected uh, and uh, with toxic elements while he was actually participating in the e-waste trade. These young children dedicate their youth to renting wooden structures and sleeping in five to six children in a shack. And I saw this, I saw eight children sleeping on bricks between their shifts, not even a pillow, not even a bed, not even a tent, because they couldn't afford it. Many of them orphans. And again, you can see the landscapes. These are the land, this is the Ogbogboshi scrapyard. What they're doing here is they're burning the e-waste because it's a quicker way to get at the copper and the gold. By the way, there's a lot of gold in computer circuit boards. Gold and copper are the two biggest uh, minerals by value. Uh, and it, that black smoke is very carcinogenic and it also blows throughout the rest of the community. So it's quite tragic that Ogbogboshi is one of the places where actual community exposure to toxics is greater than worker exposure because the community members are there all the time. And the rates of uh, neonatal death and decreased uh, female health are also very, very high. This just shows you as well, someone picking through the rubbish after they've burnt it. But I also show this slide because you see there's this, this kind of big white thing in the middle. And don't worry, you probably can't tell what it is. It's a cow. And yes, there is a cow full of milk eating all of the trash. And they will eat the cow and drink the milk. I also saw chickens when I visited the site. So again, direct exposure right into the, uh, into the supply chain of food for everyone living in the area, which may explain why life expectancy at Ogbogboshi is less than 40 years old. These people are literally killing themselves to participate in this business of e-waste collection. And then our final case is the Congo. The upper right of the map shows you where it is in Africa, kind of in the middle to the south. This is the southeast Congo near the Zambian border. What I'm showing you here is what's called the geologic scandal because it's so resource rich. There are so many reserves of cobalt 
and copper, even uranium and nickel, and even some rare earths in this particular part of the Congo. It's been blessed with an abundance of resources. And however, mining for this cobalt, ASM means artisanal scale mining, is not living, it's dying. The moment you step inside the mine, the clock starts ticking. These miners, you can see one here who's only a teenager, are exposed to silicosis, they're poisoned by mercury, they can drown, they can get traps, they can be crushed. They even can contract the plague because they bring animals with them into the mine because they stay in the mine for 10 days. Or they may be injured or catch malaria and then they die in the jungle because they're trying to actually crawl for medical help. People lose their arms or their legs or they bleed to death. And again, this just shows you how dire the conditions are are in some of these mines. I went into this mine. Uh, if you notice, this particular miner who's young doesn't have any shoes. He's mining barefoot. You can see his flip-flops there on the bottom of the photo. What's quite striking about the photo is what's not here. There is no structural support for the mine. There is no ventilation. There is no lighting. He has a headlamp. What is also striking is that the miner is so poor, he doesn't have a respirator. He doesn't have a shovel. He doesn't even have a ladder. He's literally stepping into the rock himself and he's mining by hand. So this also shows you a complete lack of protective equipment. This shows you young children between the ages of five and seven who are picking through mine tailings, which are radioactive by the way, and highly toxic. And we saw hundreds of children doing similar things. This isn't one of the industrial mines near Lubumbashi. And this shows you a young seven-year-old cobalt trader who's taking a sack of cobalt to one of the trading depots. Again, child labor is rife at a lot of these facilities. Okay, so what, what we, now that I've thoroughly depressed you, <laughs> what does this mean? What does it mean the fact that we can say, on the one hand, we support low carbon transitions? And I do, having done this research, I still advocate for things like solar energy and smart meters. At the same time, I really hope they can become a lot less damaging. So I think the first one is to remind us Energy injustice is not just a matter of fossil fuels. It is not just a matter of big, evil, centralized energy systems like nuclear fission. We also see it here with systems of energy democracy, like solar energy, as well as end use devices, things like smart meters and batteries and electric vehicles and in home displays. And what's really ironic is these are many of the technologies that we're using in Europe to fight fuel poverty. So it's a really weird situation of one group of poor suffer, so another group of poor can become better off. The second core finding is that some of the injustices have less to do with technology and more to do with governance. It may not be that nuclear is bad, it may not be that smart meters are bad, but they're bad the way that the French and English governments have done them. For instance, in Germany, most people who have taken advantage of the feed-in tariff for solar energy have been middle-class homeowners, which makes sense. They have to have access to finance. They gotta have a roof they can put their solar energy on. So you've excluded people in social housing blocks for people who don't own homes. So already you can kind of see an elitism built into the way that they design their policy. And maybe that's also because middle-income families are big voters in Germany. So there's something politically astute about designing their policy that way. Or here in Great Britain, rather than make the smart meter roll out the domain of the government or the domain of the transmissions operator, it's been led by the suppliers. And for those of you that don't know, the UK has 70 energy suppliers, 70, 11 of which went bankrupt over the last year. So it's a quagmire. It's an administrative nightmare to try to manage a smart meter rollout among that many different entities. So maybe a lot of the issues with the rollout have nothing to do with the technology and more with how they decided to adopt and promote it. Or the continual secrecy and security around French nuclear power, where it is very difficult to get reliable data and where the industry does not disclose news about costs or pollution. And this hurts the winemakers because they aren't able to disprove that many of these incidents are hazardous or not. They aren't able to get access to the information. So maybe it's the authoritarian regime of, po of policymaking that has a lot to do with the injustice rather than nuclear technology per se. And finally, in Norway, keep in mind that their transition has supported battery electric vehicles, many of which are bought by white men. 
and many of which are Teslas. And in our interviews, someone made the claim that the value of the tax incentive given by the government of Norway for a single Tesla Model S is the same value as 30,000 bus tickets. This is a great example. So government has enacted a policy that benefits one person's private automobility when it could have given 30,000 tickets to low-income commuters to take better buses into the city center. So again, procedural justice can be very important alongside distributive justice. Cosmopolitan justice, this is the one that talks about human rights and kind of globalism, also reminds us that many of these impacts occur well outside of Europe. Remember the map I showed and all those countries in red. Whether it is France exporting nuclear power, exporting nuclear technology, depending on uranium mining from Namibia, Kazakhstan and Australia, or creating nuclear waste, which will be a burden for everyone to deal with, or things like low wage manufacturing in China that makes solar energy cheap. People on factory shifts with no health care, with no union working 14 hours a day so that solar can be $1.50 per watt. Or um, some of the material inputs like copper and cobalt or e waste for Ghana, waste flows. Or at the other end of the supply chain, at the extreme upstream, all the materials, metals, and minerals we need uh, for these types of devices. And I think what I find very problematic is I support the Sustainable Development Goals. And for those of you that don't know about the SDGs, SDG 7 is about clean energy. It's about doubling our amount of renewable energy. It's about universal energy access for the poor. And it's about improving energy efficiency. And I, I support that. I actually do think that access to clean energy is a human right. But at the moment, how we secure it currently has way too many trade-offs with other human rights. And this leads to, for lack of a better term, green on green conflict, environmentalists against environmentalists, or more worrying, poor on poor conflict. Some groups of the poor lose, so other groups of the poor can benefit. And I'm very worried, sticking with the political economy of justice, that it may not be possible to ever have pure justice. It may never be about eliminating injustice. It may only be about redistributing it or picking your poison or choosing who wins, or at least trying to make sure that you have more winners than losers. And I'm very, very worried by a body of research that all of us still do that ignores all this, that just focuses on wind energy in Norway, solar energy in Germany, smart meters in the UK, and it avoids and ignores and obscures this broader divide of where Germany, Norway, and England are getting cleaner only there creating a divide with the global south. And to come back to the start of the talk, I think this reveals to you, separate from the case studies and separate from the Inapaths project, the value of energy justice. This is why it's important to talk about justice. I think it is a really important conceptual tool. Remember those triangles and nexuses that Darren showed. We are able to integrate very distinct elements that are often treated in isolation. We can talk about distribution. We can talk about policies. We can talk about global externalities. We can talk about vulnerable groups, all with the same framework. So there is a very novel conceptual tool that energy justice is trying to fulfill. Analytically, it's a good way of showing how energy systems are more than about energy. They become about politics. They become about patriarchy. They become about power and governance and behavior. Right? So it's a way of reminding us that energy is socio-technical, not just technical. I think it's a very important decision-making tool that can help all of us, even you, planners and consumers and voters and workers choosing your careers about how we make more informed decisions. When you're deciding whether you want to buy a car, when you're deciding if you should walk, when you're deciding what type of a house to buy, what type of a politician to vote for, where you put your pension, where you apply for your jobs. Think about justice. Are you supporting firms, institutions, transitions and technologies that help minimize injustices? Or are you supporting those that only maximize them and externalize them? And then finally, going back to David Harvey, don't underlie the fact that energy justice is a very positive discursive tool. Now you can look at this two ways as well. 
in this article, by the way, we talked about some of the most compelling frames of communicating about energy, and justice is one of the eight frames. So on the one hand, this is telling you if you want to have compelling narratives, if you want to actually speak in a way that your audience will resonate with, speak in the language of justice. So if you're talking about energy efficiency or nuclear power or coal, you can talk about technologies and markets, but you can also talk about justice. So there's the positive thing. The negative thing is to also beware. Don't abuse energy justice. Because it's such a powerful discourse, energy justice can be prone to critique and people can misuse it. So I guess I'm saying use energy justice, but don't abuse energy justice. And I think finally, well, I support the conceptual, analytical, empirical, and discursive reasons for using energy justice. I think there is a final reason to support it, and maybe the most important of all, and this comes from Albert Einstein, who said many brilliant things. One of them was, not until the creation and maintenance of decent conditions of life for all shall we actually be able to speak of ourselves as civilized. So another way of doing energy justice is to help humanity become what it could be rather than what it is. And with that, Javier, I'm very happy to take a small break and come back for questions. Uh, many thanks, uh, Benjamin. Yes, we take seven minutes break, seven, eight minutes break, and then we come back, okay? Thank you. Great, I will come back. Thank you. Uh, I think you have, uh, 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 well, you have talked about so many uh, really uh, interesting and exciting issues. Uh, um, so I think we can already start. Uh, maybe you, Francesco, can say something about uh, how to, how to students, how to do this, uh, uh, if they want to, to make a question. Yeah, that would be great. Um, if that's okay, uh, I'm trying to explain this to you students, but if everyone has anything or any doubts or they want to ask me in Spanish as well, um, I can help translate and everything. When it comes to the questions, it would be useful if you can, you know, book your work. You want to say, oh, I want to say something. If you can write that on the chat, because I have it right now in front of me. And then after that, I will, I will mention you and say your name. And then you can unlock your, well, your mic in order to speak. But if you want to unlock the video, that would be nice. So you can actually uh, see the speaker, you know, look yourself in the eyes and have, and have the question and answer section. Um, so I will be playing a little bit moderator in here and helping co coordinating, you know, the questions and, answer, and answers. Um, by this point, is there anyone that would like to make an initial question? Ah, it always happens, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, there we go. We have Angel David Villafranca Cáceres. Would you would you be okay with the switching on the mic? Because I see you've you've written that, but is it okay if you actually activate your mic and ask Professor Soloku yourself, please? Hello. Yes. Hello. Okay. Well, Buenos thanks days. for the presentation. It was a very informative topic. My question was, uh, how can we incentivize businesses and consumers to shift towards a much more just production that ensures safe conditions for workers? and change the, the focus from profit and lower costs, as you said, uh, uh, greed, to a much more solidary perspective? No, excellent question. Boy, you're starting off with a tough one. Um, so it has a complicated answer because obviously our global society is unjust. So we can't really expect some new energy justice business model to suddenly transform long-standing notions of injustice. And I'm reminded here in the United States, which is where I'm from, there was a famous book by Rachel Carson in the 1960s called Silent Spring. And it was about DDT, this kind of really highly polluting chemical. And she would interview these people who made DDT, even when these health studies were coming out saying DDT is toxic, DDT is causing cancer, DDT should be outlawed. And she's like, none of these people were evil men. They were usually men, right? They go to church, they, they volunteer for their community, they give money to the poor. So it's like th this notion that kind of, capitalism and greed create evil people is probably not true. I think it's, it's more that they don't always realize maybe what they're doing or also maybe the impacts of what they do. And I think the solution here, I mentioned it a little bit in terms of energy justice as a frame, but energy justice 
because it goes hand in hand usually with sustainability and with equality and with equity has a number of co-benefits, a number of things it does beyond just being morally right. Energy justice also tends to be uh, to minimize externalities, to have greater degrees of legitimacy, to help prevent future boycotts, to help insulate from liability, to help hedge with risk. So I think it's just kind of reframing, telling these different corporations not to do energy justice only because it's ethically right, but also because it's a way for them to create competitive advantage. It's a way for them to attract higher quality labor. It's a way for them to better manage liability um, in, in languages they understand, which are in terms of revenues and brands. And, and jobs, um, and also being industry leaders. So maybe it's just more kind of this new frontier for which I said that there are positive justice synergies with business, if you do it right, um, is, is a kind of path, path forward in that regard. So I guess it's reframing, trying to show them that justice is not incompatible with their business models. All right, thanks. Okay, so next one will be Mark Fernandez. You're free to go and ask your question. Hi, can, can everyone hear me all right? Very yes. nice, Mark. Okay, uh, so um, uh, then again, as, as Sanjay David did, uh, Professor Savakor, I want to, to thank you for the, the amazing presentation. It was really, really informative, and I think that you um, very, very efficiently um, gave us an, an overview of the of the all the concepts that were in play and uh, given that we're in 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 a subject that is basically um, european centered i don't want to seem to to european centric uh, in in this case uh, but i would like uh, to i would like you if you could give us um, your perspective on whether the european commission uh, plans on on the, the Green Deal, or, or I think that it's called, uh, whether it includes uh, concepts or notions uh, such as energy justice uh, in, the, in the EU's uh, proposed plan to, to achieve uh, further, um, well, an ecological transition. Yeah, another very good question. Thank you, Mark. Um, I've been following the European Green New Deal a little bit. They also have a Just Transitions Fund, which is actually pretty progressive, one of the biggest in the world, which makes sense because the European Union is generally, I think, it, as a regional entity, has the most progressive energy and climate policies in the world. It's far ahead of the United States. And countries like China are coming around, but they operate nationally, right? Um, and while there is actually an equivalent EU, by the way, in Asia called APEC, <laughs> no one talks about it and it has no power. So I think there's a lot of credit to what the commission is doing and in how they also still push their member states to meet particular goals kind of in their own way, like Poland is able to do it a Polish way and Luxembourg can do it a Luxembourgian way. The problem with this multi-scalar analysis is it shows that responsibility always falls beyond Europe. And that's very, very tricky because first of all, the European Commission has no authority, right, over a lot of the places. Like what are they gonna be doing about US gas markets or Chinese manufacturing? They can do stuff in Europe, but even then Europe, while it's a good market, is still not the leading market. And I think if you look at a lot of trends going forward, not now, where I think Europe still has a number of countries in the top 10 for GDP, but by 2050, it's like there's only one. It's like Germany, even France is out of the top 10. So there's a complete shift in global power to Asia <laughs> and other countries, Indonesia, Bangladesh, especially India, China, um, and in Russia. So I think that there's also a kind of this danger that the EU, is gonna become marginalized precisely because they're effective, because their emissions are going down, their population is stable, which means others are growing and other emissions and other sources of energy consumption will be even greater. So in a way, there's only so much the European Commission can do. And even if they will use their market power, which they have already with things like food labeling or genetically modified crops, like coming here from the United States, I'm amazed at the quality of food. And I'm so happy for the regulations the commission has. You know, in the United States, if you cut carrots, your fingers turn orange because of all the food coloring. It's like here, carrots a carrot. You cut it and nothing happens. Well, other than it gets cut. So I think that's a good example of where the European Union needs to find a way not just to cover Europe, but also, I guess, to lead in terms of norms going forward for others. And I do think they don't really emphasize in the current Green New Deal 
energy justice. What they talk about is just transition, which kind of falls within it a little bit. It's more like making sure no one is left behind as we phase out of carbon. And it's things like skills development. It's things like protection of, 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 of local rights and culture, which is a step in the right direction. And you do have some very carbon intensive regions of Europe, which are at risk. And I know this because we have another Horizon 2020 project that just started called Sintran, which is carbon intensive transitions in region uh, in, in Europe. And that, that is basically Poland, Germany, Estonia, and Greece, where we're looking very, I mean, Estonia is the world's leader of oil shale. So these are the regions that are against decarbonization. These are the regions that will need the most help. And I think that we need to find a way to make sure, I guess, Europe first, because it is the European Commission, and there's a lot to learn from Europe, but also in ways that do account for as best as we can some of these multi-scalar things. And I guess there it's just leading by example and leading in terms of norms and making sure that they push in the UN debates, in other debates, like at the World Trade Organization, they help push countries like China or India or some of the global supply chains that are providing materials and metals to be more sustainable and to fully account for what they're doing. Um, I guess that's the way I would like to see the European Union lead. I don't think you want the European Union to become the world's moral policeman. That's always a bad case. The US tried to do this for 50 years and look what's happened to it. It's committed genocide and you know, killed Iraqi citizens and a whole bunch of other things. So anytime anyone thinks they're morally superior is dangerous. So I think the, you know, a more reflective, compassionate type of leadership that just values, that prioritizes things that Europe does well, right? Which is kind of a commitment to liberalism, a commitment to human rights, kind of openness and transparency and minimal corruption is a way to lead on these really, really important issues without being colonialist, <laughs> if that's possible. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, there's also a third question. So if we could now get Sol on the line. Okay, you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation also. And um, I wanted to ask you, well, we have talked a lot about institutions and, and how do they work and how do they manage uh, all the things about energy and this. But I want to ask you, what can we do as citizens from Europe to help out with energy injustice? Like, are there any ways as consumers that we can do something? Excellent, this is, this is great. And by the way, these questions are working very well. Everyone, I can see you clearly and hear you clearly. And your English is even better than mine. So that's, uh, <laughs> it's just great. You don't want to hear my Spanish, for the record. Um, yes, today's kind of discussion was really because it's all at the national scale, right? We did four national cases and we went down into kind of communities. We still have national recommendations. You get the sense it's, it's a lot about institutions, but I do think consumers have a very important role to play. And I hinted at this a little bit in the end where I talk about your power as a consumer, as a voter, as a decision maker. Um, depending on how you account for things, you can play around with the numbers. Um, one study that I've seen suggests that households, us, right? We have over our consumption footprints, responsibility for 72% of global emissions. So 72% of what is emitted every year in some way connects with what we want to consume, whether it's a movie or a car or clothing or food or all of that. Um, so in a way we have a lot of power. We forget industry is supposed to be serving us, right? And if, if the emissions aren't related to the military or to the public sector, then it's, it's matching what we desire. And that also gives us a lot of power to shift and shape energy pathways so they're less damaging, more just. And we did a separate study, which I, I didn't talk about, but it's got a great name. It was called the HOPE study, H-O-P-E. And it stands for Household Preferences on Energy. And we ran the study, it finished last year, in four countries. Again, not Spain. Don't worry, I do have some research projects that involve Spain, but this one involved uh, Sweden, France, Germany, and Norway for high emitting industrialized countries. And there it was all about what consumers could do and what they were willing to do. And the short answer is the top three components of your carbon footprint. So the three things that you could do to help fight climate change the most and also probably associated energy injustices. Number one is food. It is not energy, it is not buildings, it is not electricity, it is food. So getting to better grips with diets, eating less meat, 
thinking about more sustainable food, thinking about food waste and where it goes, thinking about the size of food that you eat, all of those things, thinking about food sharing, thinking about maybe looking at more local food, right? I mean, food miles are an incredible debate. The average bite of food a European takes has traveled 2,000 miles to be in your mouth. Why are we buying strawberries from Argentina, right? And coffee, although it's delicious, from Colombia, right? Why aren't we doing more locally sourced things that could really cut the carbon footprint? So that's the first thing we could do. Second thing we could do is transport. But again, even here, it's not cars. Within transport, it's aviation. Fly less, take fewer vacations, or give up flying. If you were to give up flying, you would almost immediately cut your carbon footprint by a third every year. But of course, most of us aren't willing to do that. It's very hard to do that. And maybe you don't want to have another vacation in Spain. <laughs> I get that. But again, these are the kind of you know, things we can do, plus not taking cars as much, having more active walking, cycling, and all that. And then the third thing was housing. And within housing, it was heat. And so here it's predominantly don't use gas boilers for your heat. Try to find other ways of maybe a heat pump or consume less heat or join a district heat network or just turn the temperature down of your water. So rather than have your shower be really hot, it's just a bit warm. Rather than having your heat at 25, it's at 22 or 21 or 18. Wear a sweater instead of turning up the thermostat. So I do think those three things, food, mobility, and housing, will really get at the core of your sustainable footprint. And it's a good place to start because if we do those types of changes, we can cut our carbon emissions by more than half. And most of these three changes aren't life endangering. We can still live a pretty good life. Maybe we travel less and we eat a little bit differently, but life isn't like we're in the stone ages. We can still do things like watch Netflix and have cold beer. So it's not like you have to sacrifice um, too much. So I think that that's kind of what you can do in terms of your consumption footprint. And then it's just kind of the final answer is there are other things you can do besides consuming. And that's just social movements, political reform, document injustices. That's one of the things too, like you, you can be a researcher and that's what I like about our research, we expose a lot of these injustices that were, were hidden before. And so bring them to the attention of people that matter. Um, support good independent journalism and, and freedom of speech. Support politicians that have ideals rooted in sustainability rather than mass production and consumption. So I think there's all sorts of other ways you can exercise power beyond consumption. Um, but I think consumption is an easy place to start. Hey, brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, this next question, we have Marie Therese Willem. She's a PhD student. Her mic is not working, so I will read this question for you. Um, Marie, if you can still switch on the cam so that you can see, okay, you and the professor can see each other. So the question is officially, do you believe that behavioral factors be behind consumption trends or environmentally damaging behaviors can be changed? If transition to decarbonization are a matter of behavior, perception, and culture, how do you understand entrenched beliefs and behaviors to be able to shift or even adapt given the new climate circumstances? Yeah, it's a long standing debate. Um, and this debate, you know, technology first or behavior first. And you have two very different camps, some who are all about innovating technology. You even have a strategy that we've called in the energy policy literature called supply push. The argument is focus on the best technologies for energy supply and the market will take care of it because the market always does what's best and it will compute costs and benefits. So it's kind of a keep innovating and get us more hyper-efficient lights and cars. And that way, if a car is 20 times efficient, we can still have a car because now it's you know 20 times better for the environment. And then the other half, oh, and this solution too is make technologies that are compatible with people's lifestyles so they don't have to change. The other half says, no, 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 technologies, can never innovate as much as we need them to. And even then they diffuse slowly. I mean, look, we still have uh, a billion people around the world who don't have access to electricity. And that technology has been around for a century. So we don't have equitable access to a lot of these high-tech innovations. And in fact, if you wanna make a real difference in people, it's bicycles and light bulbs and cook stoves. It's not high-tech nuclear reactors and fuel cells, and it's changing our behavior. Uh, and our behavior, and those consequent changes can cut emissions much faster than technology anyway. We can all choose to stop eating meat tomorrow, right? Whereas a new fuel cell might take 20 more years to research. So I think while I like both of those debates, I think we're in the middle. I think we should simultaneously keep innovating technologies. And some of the technologies that we've innovated are phenomenal. For instance, just to give you two, three examples, 
the average thermal efficiency of a power plant was 35% in 1950. So the average power plant wasted two thirds of its energy. So you put fuel into the power plant and only one third of it ends up as useful energy. The rest is lost as waste heat. So they've designed new technologies, combined cycle gas turbines and combined heat and power systems and tri-generation systems to capture that waste heat. So now the state of the art thermoelectric power plant is 90% efficient. So again, in just our generation, we've already doubled, tripled the efficiency of a power plant. Same with wind turbines. The average capacity factor of a wind turbine was like 10% in 1970. It's about 40% now. So again, a fourfold increase in how good wind energy is at capturing wind and producing it into energy. And another really good example is lighting. LED lights are like 100 times better than CFLs. CFLs were 100 times better than incandescent lights. So we've seen like a 200-fold increase in the efficiency of our lights. And most of the time, the lights look the same. So I think that you know innovation does matter, but we shouldn't let it obscure our own responsibility and the fact that we have uh, uh, our, our kind of the ability to change lifestyles. And the kind of the second half of your question about how we change lifestyles, it's not as hard as you think. Look at us right now, socially distancing, wearing masks, not traveling. Most of us are following these behaviors. We've adopted very new practices in six months. Now, granted, maybe the threat is more immediate, falling sick, dying from COVID than climate change, which is in 50 or 100 years. And maybe personal health is a greater value for people than sustainability. But for whatever it is, it's shown that in a matter of months, mass parts of humanity and politicians can make major changes in our lifestyle in ways that actually consequently have major impacts on energy and climate as well. Because air aviation is so bad for the climate, all of these moratoriums and restrictions on travel have been very beneficial. Emissions are at all time lows for many of those sectors. The final bit of the question was kind of about how do we understand behavioral change? And here I'm, I'm delighted, I've read some of these frameworks. We do have a whole host of research in sociology and behavioral science all about how to change behavior. We have theories like the theory of planned behavior from ASGEN or Schwartz norm activation model. We'd have to activate new norms. Um, to others like Paul C. Stern and Tom Dietz have value belief norm theory, which is about how people create values, intentions to act in lifestyles. So they've studied this stuff for 30 years and they've found out which techniques work, nudging, price incentives, challenging people, even shame. Japan, Japan has, a, has a famous energy program that works very well because it shames people who don't behave well. So even that's using something you wouldn't think about, shaming someone publicly will help, help them be more sustainable. So I think the behavior element is very interesting and there's a lot going on within those different theories, all of which have high degrees of validity and all up-to-date state-of-the-art psychology and behavioral science that has unpacked behavior so we know a lot more about it than we did. Um, and I'm happy if you want to write to me later to share with you some of the newest studies from psychology that have very interesting findings. These findings, by the way, this is what's great. In the end, I'm going to overly simplify. From most of these studies, it suggests that behavioral change will get us half of the way, that people will be able to change their behaviors in ways that cut emissions by about a half. And then the other half we need is improvements in technology. So we come full circle to the classic debate, technology and behavior, we need both and behavior gets us half. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'm sure Marie is going to say thanks as well. Um, okay, so we have another question, this time from Christos Zografos. Christos, do you want to link? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the, for the presentation, it's great. Um, I work in the area of low carbon transitions and I read all your work, of course, but I cannot stop being impressed every time that I see, <laughs> honestly, yes, the, how solid the work is and how well it brings out all those different dimensions of injustice. Um, but I wanted, I would like to, if you want to pick up on, on, on a comment, on, a, on an answer that you, you gave to one of the questions, which was about the role of the, that the EU can play. And uh, I, I wrote it down, you said that uh, something like along the lines that it should uh, try to do what it does best, uh, among other things, is to promote uh, rights and, and uh, I think you said liberal uh, understanding of, of rights. Um, and you added, uh, without being colonialist, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
which is something that no, it's yeah. something that troubles me uh, while I'm reading all this, uh, all that literature, and I work in that area. And also while I was seeing, you know, the maps that you put forth here, you know, where the energy comes from, and you're a person who has been to those places and you have seen what are the uh, the impacts and the connections, you know, between peripheries and centers. So my question is simply, uh, given um, given our thirst for energy, you know, and some sort of path dependency. Uh, that, that dependencies that are in place in terms of how we develop our energy systems. Do you think that this is possible? Is it possible to promote those rights and at the same time avoid being a colonialist? Um, and if it is possible, how? If it is not possible, then what? Yeah. Excellent question, Christos. And yeah, I shouldn't joke about colonialism and neocolonialism. It's just, I think it is all relative and coming from the United States, whose political system is even in worse disarray, than the European Union. I've always admired the European Union. And when I was doing my PhD, we were always looking, I was in Virginia, which is a coal state. We were always looking at Denmark and Germany. So it's like, we've always had our eyes when looking for good examples to the East uh, across the ocean. So maybe there's just a kind of unintentional Euro preferentism from me uh, just compared to North America. But you do, I mean, you don't, this is the challenge is, I mean, I do think European institutions have lots of things that, that are worth mimicking, like openness, transparency, accountability, and good governance, and maybe others that aren't, like arrogance or bureaucracy. I mean, I think bureaucracy was a big reason the UK decided to leave the European Commission for, for better or for worse. Um, and so I don't think that the European Union is necessarily a blueprint that everyone can follow. And I know even in places like Southeast Asia, they have ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, where they've intentionally said, we don't want to be another EU. That's European. We want to be Asian. And they have different principles, like a principle of non-interference, which the European Union would never do. So again, you start to see these cultural differentiations. I still think they're worth pursuing, as in I do think some core elements of good governance transcend culture. Like I said, uh, respect for basic human rights, respect for transparency and accountability, information and access to information. These are things that I think we should do without necessarily transplanting the entire European system of governance onto poor communities in Africa or, or, or South America. And I do like, there is one of the principles of justice that I think was kind of clever. And it's John Rawls, who maybe you've read, where his kind of approach to justice is more like social contract, where justice is what each community decides it is for itself. So the argument is that you have a representative body of people who come together and they agree energy justice for Barcelona is going to be this. And we all agree to it as best as we can. And we come to the contract and we enforce it. And what the, that contract is for Barcelona is different than Madrid, is different than London, is different than Russia. So each community itself can decide which principles they prioritize under which conditions. Now, the problem with that is twofold. It's majoritarian. So in that process, minorities always tend to get stomped on. And Rawls himself said he didn't think it wanted to be colonialist. So he even said you should not impose liberal principles on illiberal societies, which means you allow countries like Saudi Arabia or the Congo to say as they are. And I don't know what to do with that. That's largely why you have the rise of cosmopolitanism in the past 50 years to critique Rawls and the relativistic nature in which he's talking about uh, liberalism and the cosmopolitanists come at it the other way and they say, you know what? All human beings have basic dignity. All human beings have basic inalienable rights. And it is our duty, not as governments, it is our duty as humans to uphold them and respect them no matter what. Your color, your gender, your ethnicity, where you were born doesn't matter. Your occupation, your sexuality, your income doesn't matter. All that matters is that your basic capabilities are harnessed and preserved and maintained. And that way you can flourish. So I think, not to sidestep your question, but I think that debate in justice between Rawls and social contract justice approaches and the cosmopolitans is where to go because it's a long-standing debate. I haven't got the answer, but I certainly think it's where we can start to look for principles that we can apply in non-colonialist ways. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, there seems to be another question from Marie Therese. So again, even if the makeup is offline, I'm going to read it for her. Um, and what do you think of elect electrification of your automotive sector? Is it a serious and sustainable solution? Or is it like putting a band-aid on a broken leg? What are some of the effects of electrification? Yeah. How do they interact with each other? 
fantastic question. I love the bandit on a broken leg. Um, you'll find yes and no. So I'm just reminded here of, of President Roosevelt. President Theodore Roosevelt used to say he wanted a no-handed economist because all we do is say on the one hand and on the other hand, on the one hand and on the other hand. And I realize I'm doing a bit of that, but I do think that electrification has benefits, but also has risks. We just published a recent study that talked about the dualistic way electrification impacts transitions. So on the one hand, there are all ways that you can do electrification of transport that are bad. Electrification for private cars, electrification uh, in ways that prevent people from walking or cycling, electrification with coal-fired power, electrification that supports incumbent energy companies that are known to be corrupt and all of that. Um, electrification that actually erodes intermodal transport and builds more roads. So that's bad. On the other hand, electrification in ways that, that help synergize with active cycling and walking, electrification of mass transit, electrification of car sharing, electrification that isn't a second or a third or a fourth car, but is a means of mobility for the poor, uh, electrification charged by renewables, electrification that takes into account waste flows and batteries and sources of mining and materials, and electrification that's planned well as part of a mode of mobility as a service is good. So there you see the kind of two ways electrification can be good or bad. And I think in most cases, it's a bit of both. In most cases, you have elements of both. But I certainly think it has a lot of promise. Uh, and if you do it on the right pathway, it can actually achieve a lot of its sustainability objectives. Now, your question, what are the alternatives? Right now, the debate, as it has been, in mobility is by modes and fuel sources. And I'll just simplify this quickly. Electrification is seen as having the greatest potential in passenger cars, rail, and some light duty buses and trucks. But that's the only place it goes. It's not seen to have much potential right now in aviation. It's not seen to have much potential right now for heavy duty vehicles, especially those that go into rural areas. And it's not seen to have a lot of potential for marine shipping and freight. There, you have these huge engines that are as big as my campus, huge. Uh, and there the idea is substitute the fuel, not the technology, because a lot of these shipping companies won't ever actually retrofit. It takes them 50 years before they retrofit any of their vehicles. Um, and so already you're starting to see electrification penetrate certain transport modes, but not others. The other answer is by fuels. And here it's a debate between right now, three contenders. The three big contenders for low carbon mobility on the supply side remain electrification, hydrogen, biofuel, second and third generation biofuels as well, including cellulosic ethanol and algal fuels. Uh, and you go back and forth between those three. It looked like it was going to be biofuel 10 years ago. Now it looks like it's going to be e electrification, could be hydrogen around the corner, especially if we make green hydrogen or blue hydrogen and all that. But it does tend to be those three are seen as the big alternatives if you're substituting the fuel of energy. On the demand side, I think it's just walking and cycling and mass transit. Those are almost always better options than any vehicle, whether it's from biofuel or EVs or oil or hydrogen. Uh, and it also helps, ha brings health benefits as well. So I would say that a future mobility pattern where we drive a lot less, walk a lot more, cycle a lot more, and when we do use mechanized transport, use electrification or low carbon biofuels or hydrogen is probably the way to go. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so next we have a question from Neil Orta. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank you again and also for your work, it's amazing. And here it goes to the question. Do you think the European Green Deal Agreement is ambitious enough? It includes the justice that you just talked about and or it's only concerned about pollution in European and does not take into account environmental, environmental externalities. Thank you. Ah, oh, great question. This question of feasibility is also one that we keep debating over and over again. And I have to give the commission credit. It is obviously a very politically acceptable package, and that's good. And it's also more politically acceptable than almost any other package that I've seen, right? Even China's kind of Green New Deal has a lot more in it for fossil fuels because the fossil fuel industry has a stronger tie there. Um, and the European targets are already collectively more ambitious than almost any other region as well, especially countries like the Nordics, where it's low carbon by 2030 or 2035. Even here in the UK, they're expecting net zero industry by 2040, which is very soon. 
So I'm hard pressed to find, even though we can critique what the European Commission is doing, when it gets down to it, I'm hard pressed to find any other policy regime that is trying to do as much. So at least in terms of the political feasibility spectrum, you're near the edge of the world leader. Now, environmentally, is it sufficient? No. <laughs> Even the Paris Accords, no. I mean, this is the problem with what's politically feasible and acceptable is it doesn't match what we need to ensure a two degree or a three degree world. Even Paris is woefully behind what science says is a safe threshold for climate change. And even then that presumes all of the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs are gonna be met. And it looks like about a third of them won't because there are countries like South Africa and others are struggling to meet them. So Paris is woefully in, insufficient and even Paris won't be fully implemented, uh, but it seems to be the best we've got. And I think rather than just get depressed and cry, which is always an acceptable option when the fate of the planet is at stake, I think what this tells me is we keep pursuing mitigation which is trying to stop emissions, but also we really invest in adaptation. We know that we're not gonna be able to mitigate it enough in time. We know that sea levels are gonna rise, droughts are gonna increase, wildfires are gonna get more severe, floods are gonna get more intense. And we start to at least ensure that for every dollar we put into mitigating emissions, we put another dollar into building resilience into the impacts of disasters. And that's why I think adaptation and mitigation are very important pathways that should be done together. Uh, and that right now, a lot of the community may have emphasized too much on mitigation, thinking we're going to mitigate, we're going to make it, and we're not. And I think that this will ensure that we at least build resilience a little bit more than we would have to the coming impacts of climate change. But Neil, I, I wouldn't be too hard on the politicians as much as they frustrate me as well. The challenge of climate change, Sir Nicholas Stern put it this way, politicians are fools to actually go and implement climate policy because politically it asks you to make political sacrifices in the present for gains in the future. And the political parties are never concerned about a future five years or 10 years away. They're just concerned about the next election. So people like Nicholas are actually surprised that so many politicians are willing to make these sacrifices now for the future rather than dismayed that more of them aren't making it. So at least we do have some political leaders and constituents who are willing to acknowledge, you know what, this is bigger than the next election. It's bigger than the next 10 years. It's about the future. And we're willing to make sacrifices, even if I get elected out of office, to deal with that. So in a way, I guess, you know, maybe we should be pleasantly surprised rather than constantly disappointed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone booking for new questions in there, but perhaps um, I'll actually go with one myself, a really quick one, actually. Because I was generally curious, there was this moment when you talked about Spain, and you said, oh yeah, there's decarbonization happening all around it, but not there. Um, as a southern Italian, having lived in Spain for a decade now, I'm curious, what happens with this, with these two countries? How do they fit in your discourse about decarbonization in Europe and everything? Great question. So I can give a little bit of, of an answer in data, thank goodness. So it's not just my lofty opinion. We did um, 10 years ago, actually longer than 10 years ago, a series of energy security indices. And energy security, we defined broadly in a way that includes lots of justice stuff. So in my mind, energy security, energy sustainability, energy justice are very similar because they're all about affordability, equity, environmental preservation, and all that. And we looked at, um, within the OECD, these are the rich countries, including Spain and Portugal, from 1970 to 2005, who had most improved their energy security, who did kind of okay, and who did the worst. And I remember it was countries like Denmark and Japan and the United States that did the best. And again, that was only up to 2005. So probably if you update it to 2020, things have changed a little bit. There was a whole host of countries in the middle. Spain was at the bottom, along with Portugal and Greece for having the worst. They, were the only countries that saw energy efficiency worsen. They were the only countries that saw diversification worsen, dependence on imports worsen, prices rise, emissions rise, and all of that. And we decided that Spain was gonna be one of the case studies we talked about in the article. Uh, the other three being, uh, the, or the other two being United States, the three, United States, Denmark, and Japan. So Spain was the fourth. And I remember 
it was interesting. There were all sorts of factors that explained up until then why Spain hadn't really yet diversified. And even the renewables push at that time, which was largely solar, was kind of slow and they were watering down the feeding tariff. First has to do with Spanish history. And it has to do with the authoritarian regime that emerged after World War II. And that was just kind of more resistant to ideas than other states. So you had like Charles de Gaulle running around collecting ideas for how to create energy independence. And then you had um, Spain kind of like, nah, we'll do it the Spanish way. So it was kind of more insular and, and focused on its own regime. Second thing I remember is you did have a very costly push for nuclear that put a lot of state resources into it, but didn't actually end up building a lot of nuclear infrastructure. So it's kind of like you backed the wrong horse and put a lot of interest there. The third thing I think was that you've restructured and privatized your energy markets. And this is the really interesting one. We found evidence that a lot of Spanish energy companies will use Spanish revenues to invest overseas, which means they're making efficiency upgrades or they're expanding business models, but in places like South America, not in Spain. So it's like Spanish consumers were captive and were helping fund competitiveness and privatization around the world, but to the detriment of Spain, because a lot of the major Spanish companies couldn't care less about Spain, it's too small of a market, and they wanted to focus on global expansionism and meeting their, their shareholders' expectations. So it was really a weird trend of these kind of Spanish conglomerates that don't care much about the country. And I think the final thing was just um, political impasse, where Spain seemed to be more evenly distributed among different political groups. Like you didn't have any political group like in France or Germany take control and push through a massive energy policy. Energy has never been that important in Spain. Other things are. I mean, heck, look what's even going on, right, with the constitutional crisis a few years ago um, in Catalonia, right? So you're occupied with other stuff. Energy is there, but it's, other things are more important. Jobs, security, sovereignty. And I think that just means that energy is relegated to one of those other issues. So that's from my memory about why Spain and Portugal uh, have also lagged. Oh, and I think the final one is geological. You're both like energy islands and that you were both very dependent on imports of energy fuels and services. Uh, and that's something too, you know, Norway has the North Sea. The UK has oil and gas fields, but I think Spain and Portugal were a bit more resource constrained. So you didn't have the abundance of fossil fuels other than coal, perhaps, that a lot of the other countries did. Okay, so the you. example is technical, oh. economic, political, and social. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. I think Professor Aregui, Javier has got a question himself. Yeah, I would like to, uh, a completely different issue, I would like to ask a couple of questions. One is related, I would like to know your opinion about the emission trading system in the EU and how affecting, uh, how effective has been this auction in model, uh, because I've been reading things in a rather different uh, way. I would like to know what do you think about this, and also I would like also to to uh, to ask you about um, because I think your presentation was very clear that uh, energy justice and in general energy policies uh, uh, should be uh, 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 embedded it into a more systemic uh, 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 policies. Okay, uh, so I don't understand why, for example, uh, um, I'm not so sure uh, because I'm not an expert in energy policies in the EU, but I'm not so sure uh, to what extent. Uh, for example, uh, uh, policymakers from different policy areas work together when they are designing this, because I guess that uh, clearly, well, it's not just in energy policy, that, that happens also in other kind of policies, but clearly in energy policy even more, okay? So I don't know uh, 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 to what extent if you know uh, if the European Union is actually working uh, across, across uh, policy areas in order to overcome some of the problems, and not just human rights, that I, I know that uh, the EU is pretty much into human rights, but also environmental rights, other kind of rights, which are um, energy rights also for, for third countries. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure to what extent this is actually taken into account. Uh, um. oh, very good questions, Javier, thank you. So the first for the emissions trading scheme, you know, I think it was better than nothing. I think, you know, the literature tends to suggest a carbon tax always is more effective than carbon trading because of what you've seen. You can give too many allowances to credits. You know, it's hard to predict trading of credits. Uh, credit prices can crash. And I think they were incredibly low. Same with the clean development mechanism of Kyoto. So both of the major carbon markets we know of, the EU ETS and then Kyoto's CDM markets, were prone to the same problems, which suggests to me it's a problem with cap and trade and, and the way that it works and some of the political compromises um, in, in, in design. That said, 
has been better than nothing. And you've seen, whether you credit it with the ETS or not, really declining carbon emissions in almost every major European Union state, almost all of them. There are a few, a few exceptions. And here in the UK, especially, I mean, emissions are down like 80% or 70% from the 1990 baseline um, uh, from where they were supposed to be, right, under business as usual. So it's been very successful. And also it's been successful for certain types of emissions. So not just carbon, but I think one of the best examples of the phase down is F gases, fluorinated gases which are all treated as a subclass of the ETS. This is things like uh, sulfur hexafluoride, uh, HFC23, uh, nitrogen trifluoride, really potent stuff where you have seen actually European states are actually ahead of where they're supposed to be under the phase down, although it's also part of the Montreal Protocol and the Kigali Amendment. Um, so these things can work, cap and trade can bring benefits. Would have it been better to have a, a tax instead perhaps but maybe again, this goes back to political feasibility. A tax is probably not as politically acceptable as credits. And it could be all the things that you and I critique the ETS for, giving too many allowances away, having poor programmatic designs that are exactly what made it politically possible. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, and we'll see, maybe going forward in the next 10 or 20 years, the, the ETS could have, could have a resurgence. Um, the only other major problem I know is leakage. And I know that the way that many states have responded to the ETS is to outsource emissions, which then gets into the whole problem of multi-scalar approaches. And obviously the atmosphere doesn't care where a ton of carbon comes from. So whether it's from here or China or Africa makes no difference. And so the outsourcing could contravene a lot of the implicit goals within the, the trading scheme. But this then implies though that we have to have a global emissions trading scheme, and that's even more difficult because you have many markets like the United States, which don't even have national trading, um, and others like South, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, which probably don't need it at the moment. And so this also underscores, uh, I don't think the fact that there's leakage is a reason not to do something regionally, but it does mean we should realize there will always be leakage when we do things at a regional scale. For your other question about European policymaking, I mean, it's weird because energy, as you, as you noted, it, energy is, is unlike many other things. The, the economist E.F. Schumacher said that energy is not like a commodity. It's a precondition for all other commodities. It's like the economic life force for everything we do. And so in a way, energy might need special consideration. It shouldn't just be put into some ministry because it cuts into rural development, economic growth, environmental quality. It's like every type of thing the government can do and the type of planning or ministries it has, energy fits somehow. And this is also why back when they had the Millennium Development Goals, this is before the SDGs, they called energy a meta-MDG because it was one of the few areas that cut across them all. So this would imply that energy needs some type of special devolved policymaking power. Uh, how we do that, I'm not sure. Um, I do think that the fairly fragmented way that energy is now embodied in the European Commission, right, it's in electricity, it's in transport and mobility, it's in IT, it works okay because they recognize those synergies, but I'm sure it could be done a lot better. One of the best examples that I know came from Sri Lanka of all places, and Sri Lanka did this once, although I haven't followed it in the past few years, they created a consolidated energy authority which subsumed control of energy from about 10 other minutes, put it into one called the Sri Lanka Energy Authority. So there's an example of where they were formed. And once they did that, they were able to actually make rapid progress on hydro and solar and other things. But again, I don't think you would necessarily see such restructuring as possible uh, within the European Commission at the moment. I mean, the European Commission, Javier, you know this, it's under threat. The UK just left, <laughs> you know? So I think the kind of, the ability for them to entertain any type of radical change right now in any way is just marginalized by their desire to remain relevant and to survive. And I hope they do, um, but I can completely understand why they're not thinking about major reforms of how they take on energy at the moment, given the political realities. Okay, uh, brilliant. If there isn't a follow up, I think we've got time uh, for just one last question from Marie Teres, which I will read again. Um, I'll shorten it a little bit because we are on the edge of the end of the meeting. So yeah. she, she would ask you, how do you define sustainability? More specifically, how do we go beyond a perception of sustainability as a problem focused only on emissions or plastics, et cetera? That's really good. Um, and I think I, I kind of hinted at an answer already. 
I think sustainability in the energy and climate space has to encompass supply and demand. So we cut through that bridge and behavior in technology. So we also cut through those dichotomies kind of in the middle. Um, I really like the Brutland Commission's definition of sustainability, uh, which is in 1987, so it's actually old, but I still think it captures really well the essence of it. And to paraphrase that definition of sustainability, sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future. And I like it because it puts it into needs, and those needs could be social, environmental, political, economic, so it's a very multidimensional definition. The United Nations has tried to draw from that and they had some language that they've stopped using recently, although I liked it, it's about 10 years ago. The rhetoric coming from the UN, when they talked about climate sustainability, they tended to use two phrases, common but differentiated responsibility. So climate change is our common responsibility, but what we each do is differentiated by our emissions patterns, by our legacies, by our income and all of that. And contraction and convergence. The argument here is that rich, high emitting countries have to contract their emissions and poor developing countries can raise their emissions, right? Countries like China or India that have very low per capita carbon footprints. And the idea is we meet in the middle. Uh, and so the responsibility is not just of us to develop technologies, it's for us to emit less, to consume less, to be more sustainable, but we still give leeway for poor countries to use the economic system to raise their standards of living. And I've liked that. I really did like the multidimensional notion of Brundtland, which would include plastics, water, air, land, resources. And I also like this notion of contraction and convergence because it implies that responsibility is not absolute. We don't expect Ethiopia or Tanzania to make the same sacrifices Spain or the United States has to make. Responsibility is real, but it's differentiated by our needs and our capabilities. So that would be how I would try to at least define and operationalize sustainability. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, yeah, I think we have reached pretty much the end of the meeting. We've had a full hours with a lot of questions. I don't know if Javier wants to make any final remarks. Well, uh, no. Just to thank to Professor Sobakor. I think it was really, really uh, uh, great to... Uh, uh, um, he has opened our eyes to all these complex issues and very exciting issues. I think that uh, uh, some PhD students who work here, they will be really uh, uh, willing to work hard on this because this is a, a very promising, as, as also as Benjamin was saying, I think it's also important for just giving a public opinion or sensible, uh, to, to provide some kind of sensibility to public opinion, okay? Uh, so, uh, well, I, I just uh, would like to thank again. Also, thank, thank to all participants for from students and also PhD students, and also of course I mentioned Francesco to you for for the coordination of this. Okay, thank so uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, Benjamin, you want to add something else? No, just thank you very much. An excellent question. Some of the best I've ever had, actually. So thank you for challenging me and giving me a chance to present my research. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, and well, uh, 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 anytime, uh, whenever the coronavirus is, uh, is finished, we'll invite you in Barcelona uh, personally, okay? Fantastic. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye now. Goodbye. Um, Javier, I will now proceed. Bueno, ya marcho. Procederé a cerrar la reunión para todos, ¿vale? Cerraré el espacio oficialmente. Okay.